Thank you. 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 He's going to be a split personality this afternoon because originally when we talked about having a panel of several uh, growers talking about the different marketing options for different crops. Well, Mark, or, uh, Jeff is going to split up his uh, time and he's going to do all of that. So he's going to talk about aronia, elderberry, chestnut, uh, black, walnut. Chestnut, uh, black walnut, some of the marketing options as it exists here in, in Iowa and, and this general Midwest region. So help me welcome Jeff Jensen. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, <clears throat> so I am Jeff, and I wear many different hats. Uh, it's the end of the day, so I'm probably going to talk loud and fast, but we are going to be uh, done early so we can get you out of here. The first hat I wear is with the nonprofit Trees Forever. I'm a field coordinator with them. I handle Northwest Iowa, which is the least uh, treed area of the entire state, mostly livestock and row crops. Well, the whole state's row crops, what am I talking about? But uh, a lot of work to do up there. I also am a hazelnut grower in northern Kasuth County, which is just 30 miles south of the Minnesota border, uh, right about the center of the state. And then I also am active with the Minnesota Hazelnut Foundation and um, am president of the Iowa Nut Growers Association. I was the fool who sheepishly raised their hand when they said, we need a president. <laughs> uh, so anyways, uh, we, get, we reap what we sow, right? So as was alluded to, I'm going to talk real quickly about who Trees Forever is because I never miss an opportunity to inform folks who we are. A lot of folks from out of state might not know who we are. And then real quickly, I'm going to run through what are some of the current options for marketing uh, woody specialty crops within the Midwest. Uh, it's not going to be all inclusive. These are just going to be some options that I'm aware of. And so if others know of other opportunities, certainly shout them out. So Trees Forever, and our, our mission is to plant and care for trees and the environment. We empower people, building community, and promote stewardship. Uh, last year was our 25-year anniversary, so we were really excited about that. Uh, we've planted over 3.4 million trees since we were started back in 1989. Uh, we are a 501c3, both, both in Iowa and Illinois, which is where we do most of our work. We have a staff of 22, and that's basically split between field coordinators like myself who work in specific regions of Iowa or Illinois. We typically work out of our homes, and uh, that's about half of us. The other half are in Marion, where we have our uh, office, and it's uh, support staff uh, that help us carry out our mission. And we have been uh, involved with some national projects and received some recognition for those projects. Uh, we assist 200 communities annually. We typically engage over 7,000 volunteers. We're really focused on volunteerism. So a lot of what we do is essentially provide grant funding to communities due to our funders. So we provide about a half million dollars of essentially pass-through grant funding. And then we leverage those dollars by getting volunteers in the communities to plant and care for trees. So it's a really nice model. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as being a voice for trees. Uh, so trees forever, as the name implies, similar to pheasants forever or quails forever. Uh, so we're trying to speak for the trees. As the Lorax would, Lorax would say, who speaks for the trees? And we like to say that we do. We like to promote the values of trees and natural areas, uh, certainly support different campaigns related to our mission, and we educate our legislators on threats and forest health uh, through, again, educating on issues like EAB, thousand cankers disease, things like that. I don't know how that slide slipped in there. It's a duplicate. So our major program areas are community forestry. That's basically with the uh, power companies, Alliant Energy and Black Hills Energy, which provide us dollars. And then we, in turn, take those dollars and or make them available to communities that are Alliant or Black Hills customers to plant uh, shade trees for energy efficiency. It's all about energy efficiency. We, have our, we also have our water quality initiatives, our working watersheds, buffers, and beyond program. I'll get to that in just a second. And then we also have a really unique partnership with the Iowa Department of Transportation, Iowa State University's uh, Community and Regional Planning. And we do what's called a roadways program that is a visioning program that we do with communities of less than 10,000 people where we'll spend six to eight months with them visioning their uh, transportation networks. And then we also have dollars available to do projects. Our Working Watersheds, Buffers and Beyond program uh, provides approximately 50% cost share to rural landowners to do all sorts of different uh, projects, uh, riparian strips, the strips, pardon me, uh, through ISU, 
uh, pollinator habitat, agroforestry practices. Unfortunately, we have a whole lot of this uh, in Iowa where we have banks sloughing and eroding. So this is a landowner we worked with who essentially put in some buffers of black walnuts and um, all sorts of different things to try to protect that. Okay, now to what I'm supposed to talk about here. So originally this was gonna be a panel of uh, Roger with the chestnut growers, uh, um, Mr. Patton with the Minnesota Elderberry Cooperative, but uh, we couldn't bring all of those panelists here for a half hour, so I'm gonna give us a quick whirlwind tour of what we have available here for a couple of these crops and of course the different marketing options that are available. So if we jump right into aronia berries, we're gonna talk about Sawmill Hollow Organic Farm. Uh, this is more or less where the aronia is originated on a commercial level. And so uh, they've done a nice job of not only promoting the aronia as a, uh, a crop to grow, but they've done a lot of the work of developing some products in-house. This one I always get a kick out of, and it tastes good too, right? Uh, different products in-house, uh, and really leading, I guess, the demand for aronia berries. So not only are they selling aronias to other users, but they're purchasing aronias from other growers to help uh, fulfill the supply that they need to manufacture some of their products. Uh, they're out in Missouri Valley, and you can find them on the web. More recently, uh, as an offshoot of the Midwest Aronia Association, is the formation of this North American Aronia Cooperative. Basically, just about a year old, they really tried to get their initial membership drive up and going last spring and into the summer. And so last year was the first full year that they had underneath their belt of doing some marketing. Uh, a lot of different growers have gotten involved with the cooperative because they're really trying to function as an aggregator, purchasing berries from a lot of different growers throughout the state, aggregating them up, taking them to a processor to be uh, washed and processed, and then trying to find some buyers to handle some of these larger volumes. They are in their infancy, so I think it's important to stress that. Whether they're gonna be viable for the long term, I think is unknown. Uh, they're currently trying to increase their membership, so if anybody's interested, uh, visit the uh, website, and they have some information available they can send you, because they are looking to up their volume, as well as the number of growers that they have. Um, that's the Aronia Cooperative. Um, they don't really have a physical location. It's in Iowa here, but uh, basically they have it set up so they'll have reefer trucks on the east side of Iowa, reefer trucks on the west side of Iowa, and you got to get them to there, and then from there they'll take them to the, uh, the processors. So. Uh, black walnuts. Uh, so the first option we have for cultivar black walnuts, and I want to stress that, uh, they're looking for high quality, uh, large, uh, worth cracking out essentially, is Heartland Nuts and More. And they're out of Valparaiso, Nebraska. And they have a bunch of different project, uh, pro products, pardon me, from whole in shell to the bagged up um, meats. And then this is uh, fascinating, the ground black walnut shells. This product is specific for those individuals that are needle workers. You put this in your pin cushion, and when you put your needles into the pin cushion, it naturally sharpens them. So a really unique type of a niche market that they use with their shells to try to get rid of them. Uh, but Heartland Nuts and More, fantastic uh, entity, and uh, again, they're only looking for cultivar black walnuts. If you're looking for wild, if you have wild black walnuts, essentially Hammond's Products Company out of uh, Stockton is essentially a buyer. And so they have buying stations set up all throughout the Midwest. We have three here in Iowa, including uh, one in Boone, which isn't too far from here. So this is folks that are collecting wild black walnuts, uh, bringing them in, getting a relatively low price, but um, enough, that, enough for them to go out and get some exercise and harvest them. And then Hammond's is actually, I don't wanna say less focused, but it seems like the, uh, the meats is a side business to them, but what they really get involved with is the shells. And taking these shells, milling them to different uh, sizes, and then marketing the different sizes of the shell as an abrasive or, or a grit or something like that. Um, if anybody watches the show, uh, what is it? Uh, Restoration, uh, the guy that does West Coast. Um, shoot. <laughs> Anyways, he does a lot of uh, Coca-Cola um, restorations and old antiques, and he's on his show before talked about using black walnut shells instead of sand and sandblasting because it's softer and... The reason is if you got any bearings on your machinery, uh, you don't have, if you use sand, you get that sand in your bearings that destroys the ball bearings. Ah. You get that into it, it doesn't do anything, and actually the bacteria will break it down with time you have nothing there. Fantastic, thank you for that. 
So they're primarily um, interested in the shell, and if you have wild black walnuts, that's what you have the most of. So uh, that's black walnuts. So certainly we have chestnuts, uh, the Prairie Grove chestnut growers. Uh, this is what Tom Wall was a longtime uh, marketing manager of and uh, all around do everything <laughs> for the Prairie Grove nut growers. Now it's Roger Smith and um, they're in Columbus Junction. And if you have uh, chestnuts and you don't want to sell them directly, you can take it to these folks and they will again, are an aggregator of chestnuts and then they have all their different markets that they're selling to uh, and all the different sizes that they can get rid of. So uh, a fantastic organization and a way for you to market your chestnuts. Elderberries, uh, this is a really great story, uh, this River Hills. They have some fantastic products out there from the jellies to the, um, the juice. This one is one of my favorites, uh, an elderberry throat coat cordial. I have no idea what a cordial is, but I know what a throat coat is. And I had a sore throat and used this stuff and it was like silk running down the back of my throat. It is fantastic. Um, so they have some different products that they're doing. Again, they essentially have growers. They're aggregating from their growers all of these elderberries, and then they're doing these different value-added products and selling them all across the Midwest. So some really cool stuff. Uh, the hazelnuts. So uh, this is relatively new. The American Hazelnut Company was just formed um, basically last year. Uh, I'm a member, and uh, it's essentially, again, an a a it's an attempt to be an aggregator for all of these small hazelnut growers so that we can take their in-shell material, do the processing, get some larger quantities to be able then to market to some uh, larger buyers, I guess you could say, so that we can meet the concern that was brought up earlier about chefs saying, I'd like to have product and I'd, have, I'd like to have it on a consistent basis. Uh, we had our first cracking party where we all got together in a commercial kitchen and basically sorted kernels and shells. It was a heck of a good time for about nine hours. And uh, we got some um, kernels that we were able to crush into oil and then the meal. And so uh, this hopefully will be a viable option going forward for growers to be able to sell their small amounts of in-shell nuts to be further processed. Yes, that was important. We had to have hair nets and uh, beard nets. I was the only guy with the beard, so. <laughs> In a nutshell, oh wow, that didn't turn out very good. Uh, this is me, uh, field coordinator with Trees Forever, president of the Iowa Nut Growers Association. That's all I have, thank you. Questions? Did you ever try a gravity table for separating shell and kernel with the hazels? The uh, question was, have you ever tried a gravity table to separate kernels from shells? And the answer is not yet. Uh, so that's certainly one of the next steps that we need to take. Uh, currently, we're using a combination of air, so we're uh, aspirating or sucking off the light pieces, let the heavy pieces fall through, and then we're also using um, a size, so a size differential. And between the two of those, we can get pretty good. Uh, we'll never get away from a final hand sort, but with the air and with the sizing, uh, we can do a pretty good job of removing a lot of that stuff, but I think that gravity table is an excellent idea for the next step of, okay, what if we have splits and we have holes? What if we have some cracked pieces? I think that gravity table would help us to get some of those cuts, so um, for further research, great suggestion. Other questions? Is that step a primary limitation for growth for the American Hazelnut Company? It's uh, plant material, without a shadow of a doubt. We need plant material that's uh, improved not only from a yield standpoint, uh, but as well as narrowing some of that um, variability so that we can get eventually to some sort of a, a machine harvest ability. So I'm kind of just being specific to the processing, like post-harvest processing steps. Um, is sorting from shell to kernel the primary limitation? Uh, yes, but there's also a size and scale issue. So keep in mind that uh, hazelnuts are a worldwide commodity, and so um, there's big nut processing companies that have the equipment that can do that to a very fine detail. Color sorters can be utilized to differentiate between shells and kernels and some of those things. However, those are very expensive machines. Those are large, large processing lines where it's such a small um, overall volume right now that one of the challenges has been identifying equipment that is both appropriate for the size and scale that we have. So I've been to California to the big nut processors and it's not going to fit for us. So we've basically cobbled together pieces from the pecan industry with their rerun aspirators, that drill cracker, phenomenal, 400 bucks. You're not going to find a cheaper uh, option for cracking hazelnuts and it's supposed to do black walnuts too. So who knows? So, but yeah, certainly 
separating those shells from the kernels is, is a bottleneck and you have to do it by hand to get all those pieces out because of course you don't want a liability or anything like that. Do you see, have any picture of a time frame towards mainstream acceptance of hazelnut as a field crop? Five to ten years. <laughs> <laughs> and they say for everything, hydrogen is a fuel and <laughs> renewable energy overall, five to ten years. So. I'd say five to 10 years. I mean, it's really gonna depend on the cultivars. We need better plant material. As an example, you know, um, the American Hazelnut Company, it's just starting, it's getting up, it's getting going. They need to be sure that they can be there for the growers. They're paying approximately a dollar a pound for in-shell. I have more invested in that just to pay the pickers last fall to come out and pick them off the bush. So it's, it's, it's tough right now because we have to A, have the, uh, the, the cultivars, the plant material that can sustain profitability, and then we have to show profitability so that we're not uh, promoting pie in the sky, which is, there's been plenty of, but we, we need to get down to show me, and then, and then the floodgates will be open. So that's my take. Any other questions? Yeah. So is there a price premium associated with selling these products compared to like, you know, their, their uh, larger commodity parts, and where what is that premium for <coughs> local or or um, you know what 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 are, is the premium the buyer would be paying for? So if I understand you correctly, um, some of these specialty crops that I just went through compares to commodity crops uh, command a premium, and why? Yeah, like your, these have hazelnuts compared to hazelnuts you see in you know generally at the grocery store. Um, well, I'm going to go back to the presentation that was a couple ago in the quality. So certainly some of the chefs that were interviewed uh, where they had their product from Oregon or wherever, it could have been Turkish nuts for that matter, compares to our local nuts, uh, there was a definite response in our quality. Uh, and so I think the quality aspect is going to be one of the premiums, certainly the local issue. I mean, again, the responses from the chefs that were interviewed was, I want to hear the story about the growers that are involved with this. If I could tell my customers that eating Minnesota hazelnuts is protecting our soil and water, that's valuable. So some of that, I think, certainly is going to be there. Then just, they're not a commodity. They're a specialty. And so the very definition is, is going to imply a higher price that both the grower needs and that the consumer is going to have to pay. Any other questions? All right. You all are knowledgeable about where to do marketing now in the Midwest. So go and tell others. Thank you.